project that he's working on right now. So um, I'll finish talking here and introduce Dr. Mangaff. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Michael. And um, thank you all for coming. Um, I first need to apologize. I was supposed to be here a couple of weeks ago, um, I, maybe two or three weeks ago, and had to uh, two days beforehand cancel uh, as a result of um, uh, an illness my wife had. She was in the hospital for a week, and so um, I had to cancel everything except for my classes. And of course, my students were saying, shucks. At any rate, it's really nice to be here. It's great to see. Um, that your Rotorac Club is up and running and off the ground. We're trying to get a Rotorac Club at Providence College, and um, if it was up to my club, uh, the Jamestown Rotary Club, we would start from there. But um, Providence Rotary Club, which is the largest in our district, is the uh, club that would be the host, and I think they would feel bad if we didn't let them go ahead and do it. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today from the perspective of a Rotarian. I am a, a member of the Jamestown Rotary Club and have been involved in, I've been the international chair of the club and served in the district, in the district um, international committees uh, from time to time and we study exchange with Robert, which my Rotarian friends will recognize. Um, I also direct the S Lab at Providence College, which is a lab uh, that's focused on students and uh, working on projects, what I call projects of meaning. And uh, uh, finally, I will also reckon from the perspective of the Global Sustainable Aid Project, which is an NGO in Ghana, but also a 501c3 in the United States. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about sanitation, a conversation about sanitation. And um, it'll be from the perspective of my work in Ghana, but now that work is spreading in so many other countries. and so. If I say a few things that are germane to Ghana, it's not so different in, in other parts of the developing world. Um, and then, if we have a little time, I'll talk to you about a few of the other projects that we're working on in the S lab. Now, uh, how many of you are engineering students? Okay. I heard there was an engineer, Engineers Without Border uh, chapter here. So you all remember that as well? Not all of us. No, just, uh, just some. I have uh, given talks at, uh, at those meetings as well, and I just, uh, it's always nice to know your audience, uh, including the, uh, the Engineers Without Borders in, uh, in, in, in Colombia. So, if you would allow me to, um, I would like to personalize the, for my first remarks. I'd like to uh, talk about sanitation from the perspective of this uh, young girl. I wonder if we can turn the lights off in the front. Yeah. Is, is there a, just the a, just a front lights if possible? Maybe that one right there. Maybe it's that one behind you. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Terrific. This young girl's name is Esther. It's a person I will never forget. Um, <clears throat> I met her some years ago when her mother showed up at a staging area in Ghana, actually in a ghetto in Ghana, where we're getting ready to do uh, polio vaccinations for this particular, uh, this ghetto. And uh, her name is Esther, kind of like the biblical uh, queen Persia, um, but uh, her life will certainly be far from that of a queen. Uh, the one good thing, her mother wanted to be sure that she got immunized. She didn't want it there to be a chance that she was going to be missed. So she showed up at the staging area very early in the morning, and she said, will you please immunize my, my baby? And um, in the United States, Rot Rotary has been trying to eradicate polio since 1985. We're working at it, and uh, the, the, with, together with uh, partner organizations, WHA, WHO and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, we're getting close. We're within striking distance. But like that law of economics, those, that last little bit is going to be very difficult. We still have a way to go. And um, she was, Esther was the first person I have ever immunized for this disease. I mean, that day and the day after, there were several hundred. And then in every visit to Ghana um, since, there have been uh, hundreds of children. So it's a very poignant moment, moment for me. This was uh, one of those moments in my life. 
because we all Rotarians, so we've written our check, you know, taken the check for, for polio, polio plus, and so on, but to immunize a child. So the one good thing is that this child, this child, Esther, will never get polio. She will never suffer from that crippling disease. Um, and so, as I say, there were so many others that we immunized that day. Um, I've got this on a stick, so it's going a little bit slow. Um, but there's a lot of other things that may befall her. <clears throat> In fact, uh, her chances of survival under five, there are 126 children per thousand under the age of five that died uh, from diseases that are preventable. Simple things, really easy things. Most of those are from diarrheal diseases. We can cut that by a factor of 10 just by improving sanitation and water uh, situation. This is where she lives. She lives in a ghetto. This is a, a uh, this this river is the, this is the edge of the uh, one of the tributaries of the um, one of the outflows of the Volta River, which is the largest river in West Africa, flowing out to the Atlantic. And you can see the condition of it. Um, this is her playground. Uh, she lives in a place called Nima, which is a ghetto in Accra. And uh, every two or three sets of shacks, there is a trench running through that ghetto carrying raw sewage. Mm. And so that's the playground of um, and these, these children are showing off their, their pinkies, their painted pinkies. When you immunize, you paint the pinky black so you don't go back and do it again. And so um, uh, it's, it's no wonder that if, we, if we're not vigilant about diseases like polio, it can come right back. As a matter of fact, it, it was gone in Ghana until the terrible situation that occurred in Nigeria, where the, um, uh, they wouldn't allow Rotarians to, to go and do the immunizations uh, several years ago. So five or six cases spilled back over into Ghana, and then the following year it got to be a few more, but then finally we were able to shut it down again. So uh, the why of sanitation? Well, we've got more than half the world's population, uh, not more than half, but about half the world's population that lacks access to any kind of improved sanitation. Two and a half billion, a billion people, and that's a billion with a B, lack um, any kind of improved sanitation. This is the so-called sanitation ladder. Uh, this is the bottom of the ladder. I don't know why it's at the top of the slide. Never could figure that out. This is um, basically you've got uh, the half of um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa with open defecation. Um, and all the attendant issues associated with that. And um, the, the top of the ladder is um, uh, things like even a pit latrine is considered the top of the ladder. So a hole in the ground that um, uh, might have some containment is considered the top of the ladder. A couple of words about Ghana because this is my, uh, I will talk a little bit about it. Um, First, the population is closing in on 30 million people. Um, the uh, education system in Ghana is a little bit, and the health system is a little bit uneven. Let me go back to that one. Uh, about, about one doctor per 15,000 people, but in the north, it's about one per 100,000. Uh, in, in Rhode Island, that would mean there would be 10 doctors. Okay. So imagine, and there will be many generations of people that will never, ever see a doctor. And in, in fact, many that will never even see a district nurse. I, uh, two years ago, I was uh, doing immunizations in the area of the Shea Mountains, the foothills of the Shea Mountains. Not a ghetto by a long shot, but just these mud huts that, you know, you walk, you have two mud huts here, and then you walk another half a mile. There might be another one there. And, um, there were two things that happened in that. Is it one, uh, there was a mud hut and I didn't see anybody around, so I just shouted inside, knocked, knocked on the door. And there was a, I don't know, probably a woman, young, young girl, a girl really, 17, 18 years old, who had just given birth three hours early, mm -hmm. earlier. No one else was around. And I said to my Rotarian colleague, how is that possible? How did she do this? And. Um, he said, I said, who took care of taking care of the, you know, cutting uh, the uh, bill before tying you off? He said, it was probably bitten off. She probably bit it off. I imagine. I mean, 
Another place, uh, a few miles away, there was a young boy, he was probably 13 or 14, but he looked like he was about 9, who had a white scab from the, his forehead to his back, the back of his head. And I'm not a doctor. I, you know, I had no idea what he had. And no district nurse, nobody has ever seen him. We had to follow up with afterwards to try to pinpoint on the map where this particular house was. Um, never, you know, no district nurse. The, the health care is just absent. And I was thinking, because at the time that the that little child was born, three hours before we got there, I was walking and I've been th I was thinking about home. My first grandson was about to be born. And to his, my, my son and his wife are, they're in their 40s. They're, my son is like, I don't know, his late 40s, and my, his wife is about 41, 40, 41. And so they're a little, you know, concerned, a little bit older in life, having, having this child. And I, but I thought, you know, she gets to a hospital, she'll be surrounded by experts. If a little something goes wrong, something will be taken care of. Can you imagine if something went wrong with this birth? And it goes wrong, if that things happen. And in the absence of any access to health care. Anyway, I don't want to dwell too much on this. A uh, couple of things. The education system is a little bit uneven. One of the reasons why the Global Sustainable Aid Project got involved in Ghana in the first place is because uh, particularly girls in, in junior high school typically drop out more frequently than boys do. And um, education is just not valued so much. So the Global Sustainable Aid Project, the NGO in Ghana, got involved in trying and building programs to help keep girls in school. That was pretty much their starting point few textbooks, the average, you go into any region outside of perhaps central Accra, um, even in the greater Accra area, just from a few miles outside of the Accra area, and what you find in schools are no toilets, no water, uh, or, or water is taken from a dirty stream or something, and uh, no books, no computer, no internet, and in some cases no power. Where do you start? I mean, how do you begin? dealing with education, literacy rates, and so on. Um, a few years ago, I wrote a paper about how the condition of water and sanitation impacts morbidity, mortality, uh, community development, and education, to say nothing about uh, human dignity. Um, but I think if you're a Rotaractor or a Rotarian, you understand that. If, the, uh, if, if there's no access to water, um, education is impacted, especially the impact uh, is, it, is an impact on, on young girls. In the villages, it's the girls' job. I don't know why it's not the boys' job, but the girls' job to go fetch the water. And so uh, it can take uh, 30, 40 minutes just to get down to the, 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 the pond where the water is. And, and that, that pond is used for washing oneself, washing one's clothes. Um, and it's also the, the, the water for domestic water use. Uh, so there's an impact on education, and especially hitting young women. Um, the issue of human dignity, I mean, what dignity is there in a public toilet, even if there is one in, in a village where you have to remove your clothes? People remove their clothes before they go into the toilet because they're afraid of soiling their clothes. They're afraid it will smell. And if you, the, the person who collects the money for the toilet sits upwind about 150 to 200 feet away because you can't stand the odor and the flies. So this is a vector for disease, and it's uh, not so many people have written about human dignity issue. It was um, Paltrow, Elizabeth Paltrow at, at Syracuse University who wrote a really good paper on this. So what can be done about all of this? And how did the uh, GSAP get involved? What is it? Uh, how did I get involved? And I want to just concentrate really mostly at the bottom of the line here about the toilet. I want to focus on the toilet. Um, GSAP got started in 2006, and I'm really proud to say that it was started by my granddaughter. I have a granddaughter who is quite a bit older than you, uh, all of you. Um, and um, she's in, in New York City. She graduated with uh, a uh, bachelor's in medicine from NYU. And she started the project as really a, a literacy improvement project, especially for young women. Eventually, she got involved with the trying to do something about the condition of toilets in the village. Um, and so she said to me, uh, Poppy, she said, we need to do something about sanitation. You work in water and, and, and sanitation. We need to 
do something better than what exists in the in the country. By the way, these are <coughs> the names uh, of the toilet. I I found uh, you know the Dunny, the El Bano, the Jack, Sheriff El Jerry, uh, the Head, the God of Abraham. Uh, all sorts of interesting names that you find that people use for uh, a toilet around the world. Of course, the outhouse, we all, the Oval Office, that's a cool one. Um, the pool, the, bot, the body, the powder room, the privy, uh, let's see, the small house, and it goes on and on and on. Um, so you probably recognize at least some of these. The throne, that's the one we used to use in our family. And then there's the water closet, the WC, the apartment, and so on. So we started with the toilet. That's the place to start. Um, it's the place to start because if you can isolate waste from space, then that 126,000, 126 per thousand children under five, you've saved a lot of them. Uh, we started with the toilet uh, at, in, in the S lab, but not the common toilet, not the toilet that was developed uh, in 1775 by Alexander Cummings, the, the, the toilet that you and I use today. All right, the, the P trap or the U trap. We, we started with, we didn't start with that um, because there's not much water available in the villages. So you have to pay attention to water. And we didn't do any unusual or uncommon models like the one you see in Houston here, where right on the street you can walk into this little uh, restroom and you can see out, but they can't see in. It would be a little bit unnerving. I wonder if there's any constipation that results by being in a place like this and looking outside. Anyway, we didn't start with that. And uh, here's another one that was kind of interesting. Imagine going to that little party at the after final exams, and you're at a house like this, and you need to use the bathroom. You walk into this. Some creative person has painted uh, quite a scene there. Imagine stepping into that. That would sober you up in a hurry. Um, nor is it this one from uh, the Nibon 2 Corporation. Japan, a little portable thing, <laughs> suitcase. And then there's all sorts of crazy things, the bumper dumper and so on and so forth. Um, no, we started with developing uh, the micro flush toilet. And what is the micro flush toilet? Um, it's a, a very simply conceived system. Uh, water is used from hand washing. But it, a little tiny bit of water is used to wash hands. Not the 425 cc's that the World Health Organization says is right for everybody. That's just way too much. Um, you can wash your hands on 150, 175 cc's of water and still get your hands clean, um, provided you wash them with soap. So this toilet encourages hand washing right in the stall. I can't figure out why anybody would ever build a toilet and not put the hand wash inside the stall. We've gone around and we've checked um, uh, fecal coli counts on different places in the toilet. The dirtiest place in the toilet, dirtiest place, is the stall door handle. It's it's nasty. And even worse than that is the water tap, the handle, of the spout of the water tap. So if you can use something that's faucetless, you know, without the without the valve, you know, you'd be better off. Anyway, that water is used to do the next flush of the toilet. It flushes on 150 cc's of water. That's this much. That's this much water. And that water is reused. It came from the previous user's hand line. So this is the idea. And what that valve does is it isolates waste from space. So the freshly dropped waste is isolated from human contact. So our toilets, there are no flies, there are no odors. I think I may have mentioned to Carl that a Rotarian at the Rotary Club of Acre Airport knew about our making toilets. He says, hey, Prof, Steve, can I come out and, and visit one of your toilets? I said, sure, come on, Wasi, uh, whenever you want. Let me know when you're coming. He said, Sunday after church, I'll meet you out there. And I told him where to go, and he came, and as he was pulling up, the windows of the car closed. <laughs> His wife was there with her Sunday finest, and she was not going to get out of that car go see a toilet. Just wasn't going to do it. And he pulled up pretty close, get out and we're talking. I said, will your wife join us? He said, well, she's, uh, she doesn't want to really smell a toilet. He says, by the way, where's the toilet? I said, you're standing right in front of it. He says, where? Oh, he said, is there really a toilet in there? I said, well, open it up and find out. 
Oh, he says, it must be brand new. It's never been used. I said, it's been used for two years. He says, but there's no smell in there, no flies. I said, there never will be any smell in the flies from our, our toilets. That's the whole Directly deposited, and um, um, it's com uh, there's a, inside the digester, there's a, a filter that rapidly separates the liquids from the waste, from the solids. And then the solids are composted, and it's an aerobic digestion process, but it's enhanced with a macroorganism. And the macroorganism we use worldwide now, 14 countries, the macroorganism is Ifatina. So uh, the biologist in here will, the um, city of Ifatina is a common earthworm. Maybe when you were young, you did a little fishing with your dad or something, a little red a little worm. That's, that's, the, that's the organism we use. Uh, do we have to use that? No. There are other organisms that work really well. In fact, we think we may have a use for the, for the term of cockroach. In, in, in the ghettos, sometimes a cockroach will get in right before they flush the toilet. There will be a cockroach going in, and that's it. They just take over the digestive. And they digest human waste like you would not believe. But also, the uh, black soldier fly larvae works very well. Um, and there are other organisms as, as well. And so, um, it, I mean, this is the last thing you want to hear about, about human feces and so on, but let me come in. Okay. So, um, typical uh, in, a waste, in the waste stream is that 150 cc's of hand wash water, um, about 250 cc's of uh, urine, and a cc here is about a gram because of the density of water, and then about 124 grams of feces. And here's the interesting thing. The E. fatida really does its thing. I mean, I love those creatures. They're not on any kind of a union contract. You don't have to pay them. Okay? <laughs> they work 24-7. And what they do is they reduce, they reduce the solids. Look at the reduction. And this is very conservative. A colleague of mine that I've worked with in Ghana, he believes it's down to about three grams. I don't think it's that little, but it's much less than 15 grams. That's a huge mass reduction. And so, um, and everything else is the leachate and, and volatiles and various vapors and so on. The leachate is still, uh, it's like the, it's like the effluent that comes from the top of your septic system into a leaching field. So that goes into, except that it's much less of it. I mean, it, 15 use, users per day generate about 8 liters of that leachate. That's a little so-called, not a septic system field three times the size of this room. So that's the uh, thing. And the price, well, those first prototypes, by the way, when we did this, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation invited us to apply for a Grand Challenges uh, Award, and we won one. And that was really helpful to us because it moved this project, I say it moved it ahead five years, at least five years. We were able to get all of our stuff out of the laboratory into the field and see how it works. Uh, and that's what that organization does. Uh, the Gates Foundation, they want, they, they, they're trying lots of things. Some have failed, some work. They came to Ghana after two years. They met with everybody who had a prototype toilet. And they left saying that, they said to me that, and I wasn't surprised, they said, uh, Steve, you know, you guys have got the solution to the menace of sanitation in the developing world. And I said to him, uh, I said, this is to Dule Kani, who's the head of that, that division. I said, Dule, he's a, he's a PhD in sanitation from, um, from um, Cote d'Ivoire. And I said to him, I know we do. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think we had a good solution. But he and I agreed that that's, that's only a tiny bit of the problem. You have a good technology, but now how do you get it to go to scale? And that's, that's the challenge. Well, the first thing is, that's too much money. We're not working with people who can afford $1,200. We're working with people who can't even afford a dollar. They're working, they're earning three, two, three dollars a day. The lowest two quintiles of the household income spectrum. Those are the people we work with. And so you have to make it affordable. And the first thing we did was, instead of this being a factory type of system, in a way I contracted, I subcontracted uh, sort of a factory development of this thing. I said, we've got to make it locally, with local materials, by a local maker. And that does two things. If that maker is trained and knows how to make these, it creates a business for that person. At the same time, it solves the mass of sanitation in his community or her community. We do have some women who talk makers, by the way. There's one in Kenya. There are three in Ghana. 
out of maybe 40 people, 50 people. And there's also uh, one in uh, Liberia. And by the way, that $300 includes a $100 profit to the toilet maker, so they do really well. This ups their income by an amount you can't imagine. And so the single stall, those first prototypes looked like this. They had some tile in them and so on. We don't use that anymore, not with the, the local design. Um, it looks something like this. This is one we built actually at a farm in the United States here, just for testing purposes. It looks very much like this. Um, except the exterior can be made from lots of different materials. It's whatever is common in the local country is what we use. So, for example, it could be mostly wood structure. It can be the typical block concrete structure. It's built right on top of the digester. Uh, in Ghana, they often use this tongue and groove on, on, um, on a frame construction. But our lab has also developed one uh, with uh, recycled billboard fabric. Billboard fabric is a nuisance item. It's found pretty much in every market in the world. It's 12 cents a foot. 12 cents a foot, so you can really build it. And this is built with 3 quarter inch, um, 3 quarter inch PVC. Um, but it can even be a shower curtain. If that's all that the family can afford, if that would get them a toilet, fine. Put it, if it's out in the rural village, put a shower curtain around it when you can afford to do something more, maybe even for yourself. Bamboo or something of that sort, then fine. This is one that was uh, uh, just recent. Carl, this was recently done in uh, by uh, toilet. This is sponsored by the Rot by Rotary Club, by the Rotary Club of Techima. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the Rotary Club of Tomali. And this is just a two uh, stall toilet for a small vocational school in Tomali. And so, um, so now the, the point is that when you have half of the population on open defecation, imagine just bypassing all this stuff, bucket latrines and all that stuff and getting down to uh, a toilet that really isolates waste from space. Imagine what the possibilities are, not just in terms of pure, the improving the condition of sanitation, but all those things that are connected to it. You know, girls' education is impacted by lack of sanitation, in a big way, in a big way. I once went to a school, the headmistress said to me, Prof, you know, you, you, your, that organization, GSAP is working with uh, helping keep girls in school, but you don't understand that girls are not as interested in school as boys. I said, really? Well, really? Where did you come up with that? Well, you know, and they also don't need it. You know, they, they have to work, learn to work at home and pound the foo foo and cook all the stuff and so on. And they're, they're just not interested. I said, why do you say that? Well, the absentee rates, Prof, in this school of women are higher than men. I said, really? Good. Let's take a look at the attendance register. So you open up the attendance register, and you go through and you say, oh, here's Leticia, she just missed school here. You go back a month, she missed school there at the same time, um, you know, and so on. And it's the same, the same pattern. And then all of a sudden, when you explain, there's no facilities. There's no way for Leticia and her, her friends to manage their menstrual cycle. All of a sudden, the light bulb goes off, and maybe, maybe, it's not that they're disinterested in school. It's maybe you don't have what it's needed. So yeah, it's connected. Trust me, the condition of Watson is connected to education, girls' education especially. You have to see these public toilets, these smelly things. They line up at 4 o'clock in the morning to use them. I never could understand why someone who has to be at work at 7 o'clock or is selling in the street at 7 o'clock, why they would have to use a toilet at 4 o'clock. Why is that the habit? It's the habit because of the open defecation where especially women, especially women, would go out under the cover of darkness, preserve some sense of modesty, oftentimes exposing themselves to a security issue just to relieve themselves. Relieving ourselves is not a choice. It's a necessity. It's a necessity. As Rose George, the UK, the young UK journalist said, I force my students, by the way, to read her book. Before they can come into my lab, they have to read about Rose George. And as she said in her book, the title of the book is The Great Necessity. We don't have a choice. We have a choice of whether we're going to eat breakfast or not, right? We sometimes might skip breakfast. But we don't have a choice in terms of relieving ourselves. It's something we have to do. 
So the GSAP model is one where uh, lots of players in here. The S lab, a lot of the technology you're seeing came out of my lab at, at BC, and, and it came from students like yourself. Just prodded a little bit, pushed a little bit, encouraged. Uh, to use their, their best thinking and, the, and the, the recently acquired engineering and, and other skills. Um, and then, but, but everything that comes out of our lab that we think is going to be successful, we usually prototype through, the, uh, through GSAP. And the toilet technology, which has been successful, we, we drive through them. Uh, they, uh, they, they, together with us, will provide training to builders. We call the builders toilet makers. And um, the toilet makers will uh, often to be supported by organizations with, or identified by organizations that have a sanitation vision, an NGO or other, other. And then they also try to partner with micro lenders in the community because even that $300 is a lot for a household. A household in Ghana usually consists of about three families in a little block, maybe 15 people. They're earning $3, two, $3 a day. How are they going to afford it? But, but they manage to. We've made loans, tried, tried this out, the, the, the poorest household, we made loans and there's never been a default. It's the great necessity. And so when there's a micro lender available, it, the, the model works beautifully, but there isn't always a micro lender. Some of the real rural communities, there's nobody lending money. And so uh, you have to work, you have to, what we're working on now, I'll show you one slide on this, we're working now to build an enterprise in the community we call a micro franchise enterprise that brings together both the building function as well as the micro lending function. And typically, uh, $200 is loan, $100 either in kind by helping to build your own toilet is put in, and at 20% interest, which is less than half the interest rate in Ghana, thanks, they $10 a month, two years they own the toilet. Now, Gates was right. The difficult part is scaling up operations. We began in August 13, where we had you know, just our own little system here, and then uh, many, well, quite a, few, quite a number in Ghana. So that's when we kind of started with this idea of a locally sourced version. And I said if we could get you know, maybe three or four toilet makers around the world uh, going with this model, that would be great. By September, um, of 14, we had four, and then you can see what happened in April. It's now we've got several uh, more coming in. Um, by July, it's really starting to fill in. This doesn't mean that we've got the whole country. We've got one, two, or three toilet makers, or in some cases, a, little, a few more. Kenya has been really incredible. Um, Jeffrey Nyakamba, he's training other. It's sort of it's like a nuclear breeder reactor. You, know, you train somebody, and they get really good and excited. They want to train other people to go into their communities. So that's a nice, nice feature of the model. Um, and then, uh, and this isn't the only model that can be used to scale things up. I mean, an investment of a few hundred thousand dollars could be made. You could try to make it out of an alternative material like plastic. You know, hire a good plastics engineer to design the tool, the injection mold, um, and build it in, in China someplace, and then ship them to every market in the world. But by the time they wind up in the hands of that household, they will bust them. And they won't be doing anything for the local economy. Um, also, we're in our lab not yet convinced that you can make it from another material. We're doing all sorts of temperature studies. The engineers in here will know about the equation of heat conduction. So we, we, we solve that Poisson equation in three dimensions for the boundary conditions of the problem. And um, uh, we get all the temperature profiles. We're working on this right now for cold weather. Um, we were contacted by um, a group in Lebanon uh, that are working with Mercy Corps. Uh, the Gates Foundation is working with Mercy Corps. The Gates Foundation told Mercy Corps, call us. And we're not yet sure that it's going to work. In the, I, didn't, I didn't know so little about geography. I thought Lebanon was really warm climates. It's cold. It's like this. It's like Whistler. So um, we're now doing all those temperature calculations. So far, so good. Cross your fingers. Uh, these are for refugee camps in the Bikaa Valley, uh, where uh, people are coming over from Syria uh, to occupy these places. So that was December 14, and I don't know, count them up, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 13. We're now at 14. Uh, still a long way to go. 
would soon be um, Haiti. Pardon? We would soon be Haiti, right? <laughs> Haiti is on our, they're on our radar screen. Okay, so be kind to Carl here. Um, and um, uh, Michael, if I have a few minutes, I would like to tell you about some other interesting things. I think they're interesting. These are some of the other projects we worked on. We started five or six years ago. We built a co-op in Ghana to turn agricultural waste into charcoal. It's a really important thing, especially in places like Ghana where they burn wood, charcoal, uh, for, for uh, cooking. And in the last hundred years, 80% of Ghana's forests are gone. And they're going at a rate of 2 to 5% per year. And it's like it's impending disaster, and you can't get anybody's attention. It's hard to get anybody's attention. But uh, so it's possible, and um, uh, the, the co-op is still going. It's up in the eastern region of Ghana, you know, people making charcoal. The, 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 the tough thing, and I think you and I were talking about this a little bit, if you've got, uh, if you've got the, the government involved, the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister, the, the head of the National Charcoal Board, came to our presentation at the University of Ghana. I had all of my students doing what I'm doing, presenting their, their work. And he came to me after he saw a prof. He says, this is great. He says, we're going to find a place to uh, centralize this, build a very, very large pyrolization plant, and so on. I said, you, you missed the whole point. If you sat here, Mr. Minister, with all due respect, you sat here and listened to this, and you think this is a big industry, centralized, that we're going to take waste from all over the country and bring it to one place, and then transport the finished product back? It's not. This is not a lion. It's a whole bunch of pussycats. Mm -hmm. um, all the students got it, all the professors that were there got it, but the minister didn't quite get it. We've worked on gutters from garbage, rural rainwater harvesting, and that's a common, a very popular thing for student groups especially to work on. Right now, um, Lindsay Witt in our lab is working on a low-cost, soft water to harvesting tank. The big problem with water harvesting is if you're earning $3 a day and the poly tank costs six or $700, that's a whole year's worth of wages. You have to stop eating and drinking water and stop everything you want to live afford it. Uh, we're working, uh, last year we rolled out a very comprehensive school wash program. Millions of dollars are spent on school hand wash, trying to get children to wash their hands with soap. And they have all failed. And millions of dollars, global hand wash day. You go to the schools, if you try to encourage that, oh, the children will write little posters, put them up on the wall. The local chief will come and he'll fill up the tank so there's plenty of water. They take pictures of the child sitting under this faucet with water dripping on him. And then a week later, it's all gone. It's stopped. There's been a lot done on this, but not much, not much success. And this isn't just an engineering or physics type of thing, applied physics type of thing. It's a psychology thing. So I brought two uh, psychologists into my lab last semester. And they came up with something that we're piloting in two schools. One school, the headmistress already dropped it, said, we don't. Hand washing with soap is not necessary, so she dropped it. But the other school is really excited. So we've got to pilot in a few more schools and see if it works. Um, but this is what we're really getting excited about. We're going to be publishing a paper on this at the AAPT meeting. All of my students are going to do this next uh, uh, July in, uh, in, in Maryland. It's, what do you, a GSAP has been giving books and computers to schools for so many years. It's already 150,000. The next container goes out will be 175,000 books that have been given to schools, rural schools, and hundreds of computers. And it's going really well. In fact, the last uh, 50 schools have been under a global grant with Rotary. Going well. But when that school comes in that really needs help, and they see their other, you know, a few other schools getting computers, and we can't give it to them because their school has no power. That's, what, that, that's an issue. And that's the school that needs it the most. So we've challenged our students in the lab to develop something we call lab in a box, learning lab in a box. And uh, the first version of this consists of a, a number of tablets, say a half dozen tablets, a 12 volt battery, and a uh, solar collector. And both of these have been sized um, based on a dynamic model that we've run. You don't, want to buy, you don't want to invest too much, you don't want to invest too little, everything has got to be just right. And so each of these has, it says 64, but it's each, the tablet has 32 gigabyte uh, external uh, uh, micro SD card. That's the maximum you can put on the tablet. And on that 32 gigabyte 
thing is a portal, what we call an offline portal, that has a very rich set of educational materials. And this is now operating in six schools. We can be track of how it's going, but by and large, it's going pretty well. Second version of the portal, the big thing here, the big value here is the portal, because that's where thousands of books are on that portal, children's books. There are hundreds of textbooks. The entire Rachel Initiative is on that little portal. All of the Khan Academy, everybody's familiar with the Khan Academy, all of that's on there. All of the all PC materials. Wikipedia for schools, okay? And, and dozens and dozens of websites that we've gotten permission to put on the portal, teaching children to read. Uh, this is our first version of it, and if there are any, anybody majoring in electrical engineering here? Yeah, you're probably cringing at this. Um, um, it, it, it took a while, but we uh, decided that we can do better. We've, we're working at 5-volt cells instead of 12-volt. 5-volt cells that will produce 5-volt solar collector instead of 12-volt. I mean, here we are, we're going 12-volt to an automobile lead-acid battery, and then we have a distribution, you know, cable and distribution thing down here, and then off each one of those ports is a 12-volt to 5-volt converter, which gobbles up a little tiny bit of of power, okay, only to deliver five volts to these things, these guys, right? Well, what we're doing is now working at five volts here, forgetting about this, using lipos, and um, that roll five volts. So we're saving a little bit of money, but we're saving, in fact, it might be a little more than a little bit of money, that the, the final line is not in on that, but we're also saving space, weight, performance, the whole enchilada. The second thing, that the second innovation is the Raspberry Pi. And I'm sure all the engineering students here know about the Raspberry Pi. How many know about the Raspberry Pi? Yeah. Here's the least expensive version of the Raspberry Pi computer. It's smaller than the size of a credit card. This is the Model A Plus. It has only one USB port. B has two or four. It draws about a watt of power, about one watt. And we've beefed it up. We have a we have a 64 gigabyte port. We've beefed up our educational portal to twice as much as what we had in that first version. And it's now really rich. And uh, we have a Wi-Fi dongle on it. And we've set it up so that it um, kind of self boots. We don't even plug in a monitor. God forbid we should plug in a monitor at 50 watts. It'll take an HDMI monitor, but we don't use a monitor, we don't use a keyboard, we don't use a mouse, we just plug it in. 30 seconds later, every client in the house accesses this. This is the file server. So this is the file server. Everything is on here. Everything is on here. And oh, by the way, power is going on and off. That's nasty for these things. Like, I'm the computer. The LiPo that we're working with now. Lipo battery will keep it running for 60 hours. And the mean time of power failure is in about, about a day, one to a day and a half of power fails. And that's plenty of time to do an orderly shutdown from a client. This is this is a game changer. This is a game changer. Because you don't have you don't you don't need the internet. Right? It's all a lot. And now now what we're working on is we're taking the entire Ghana curriculum. I have four students working on this. It's a hard job taking the whole, entire Ghana curriculum in every subject and matching it to all the things that are on the board. It's really very, very, very powerful. So is that the end of the story? Almost. I mean, you're putting a tablet into the, into the school. Everybody knows, especially in engineering, what's on that tablet. There are um, a half dozen instruments on the tablet. There's an accelerometer, a gyrometer, some um, uh, a magnetometer, okay? All sorts of instruments that are built into the tablet. All right, that $55 or $60 tablet has all of that built in. And so uh, last year at the AAPT meetings, I was, I was explaining, um, I'm just slightly enthusiastic about this. But I was explaining to a colleague, I was at a workshop, explaining to a colleague that we're trying to extend this lab in a box. He found the lab in a box 
fascinating in its own right, but he, I said, we're trying to extend it to build a science lab for the schools. And I told him what we're doing. We're, we're, we're basically starting with the tablet. We have all of these apps, instrument apps, simulation apps, analytical tools, references, but especially the instruments. And we're working out the various science activities. The last one was um, uh, Vesta Gary last week came in and she said, look at this. She said, I made my own resistors with a piece of index, an index card, and a number two pencil. I made resistors. Hmm. And I run a little experiment to demonstrate Ohm's law. I said, good, why don't we do resistors in parallel and resistors in series or something this week? Let's see if that, we can do that, you know? And um, just working on that. So we, and we have uh, dozens and dozens of activities. We add to that, because not everything is there. For example, uh, it'll happen soon. It'll happen soon, but it's not yet on the tablet that you can measure voltage. Unless you want to go inside the tablet. Um, you can go inside the tablet maybe butts around with it. Um, so we have to add some supplementary instruments, supplementary instruments and components. One of them is a multimeter. A three, four, or five dollar multimeter really enhances the utility of that whole system. Um, and by the way, I, I don't want to minimize what's on that, that tablet. I mean, one app, for example, on the tablet is a function generator. You can generate a sine wave, a square wave, a triangular wave of any frequency, and if it's in the audio range, you know, it'll play it for you. We'll put a 440 cycle per second wave in there, and you'll hear an A. You'll hear it play it for you. All right? And then there's also a Fourier analyzer. Uh, engineering students, is a Fourier analyzer that will detect a sound wave and do the Fourier components for you. On that, app, on that Android, I teach a course at Providence College called Android Physics. I use nothing, nothing but the Android device to teach it. That's how powerful this little devil is. We have thousands of dollars worth of, you know, body sensors and libraries and all that kind of good stuff. DAX and, you know, lab views and all that kind of We have all that stuff. But, but, I force myself to use just the Android device. So, things like, even an experiment like the Doppler effect, you know, the shift in frequency. If you got two tablets, one is playing a sound, and the other one is moving and listening to the sound, you can the Doppler effect. It's cool. I, now I've got you, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, now you, that, that's, it took a while, but I've got you. The LiPo battery, we use that as a power supply. And a wonderful power supply it is because it will go for 60 hours um, against a 300 ohm load. But the interesting thing is that it stays the constant voltage until it gets near the end where, where it's going to run out. And then it does this, this, this quick shutdown. All right. So the LiPo battery is our power supply in the, in the rural school. No power. Doesn't even, we don't even need the power. Well, we need to be able to charge it with, with the sun. And then we have a whole bunch of supplies in there, like number two pencils and things to make resistors and uh, things to, uh, to complement the motion experiments. And what is all that equal? The tablet. Uh, and by the way, those instruments and components, I, I've got a microscope in there. Okay? The microscope is $8. A 60 power microscope on top of your uh, smartphone is $8. In quantities, it's about $6. Um, what does that equal? It equals a laboratory. And a laboratory can be life-changing. It really can be. And especially in rural communities. I mean, there I can show you TED Talks where somebody, a fellow I just heard, read about, who had a TED Talk. He was in Ethiopia during a drought. His father was a, fam uh, a farmer. Everything was good, life was great until the famine, until this uh, drought came. And he had to do something for his family. So he walked to a village where he knew that there was a library. There was one book on physics and there was one book on wind power. And he built a windmill. The windmill produced a few lights. He built a second windmill. What did he build it out of? Junk. He found the junkyard, the scrapyard. And the second windmill he built was to get some water out of the, out of the ground. Uh, books matter. These things really, really matter, these kinds of resources, especially when there's nothing there. So at any rate, that's the science lab in a box. It's just an add-on. And the AAPT, that fellow that listened to me make a pitch, he said, getting any money for this? I said, well, I'm getting some money internally, a few small grants to develop it, but nothing to roll it out. What's your plan? He said, I want to roll it out to eight schools next year. 
So he said, gee, about a fund will do something like that. Ah, uh, he says, you're too late. He said, we're meeting tomorrow. We're meeting Tuesday, it was a Sunday. And he said, we're meeting on Tuesday morning to evaluate this year's proposals. And he says the deadline was a month ago. He says, damn it, this is so interesting. He says, can you get me a proposal in a hurry? I was going to, I wanted to, this is in Minnesota, I wanted to see the Minnesota Twins play. I had tickets for the baseball game. And so I said, well, I really want to sit in my hotel room and check out the proposal. And they funded it, which is good. So eight schools will try it out next year, see what happens. And I think that's, um, I, that, uh, you have a couple of flyers on some meaningful projects, you know, for Rotary Clubs, for Rotary Clubs. And uh, Carl is doing uh, a really, we, we, we sort of, we have some technologies that are really going to be able to help in that Haiti project. The water, san especially the sanitation and the rural technology. And so, um, and some of these projects are really inexpensive. That, that schools that have power, um, 500 bucks get some computer lab in the box. And, you know, for the, for the, uh, the server and, and the batteries and all that kind of stuff. Um, the schools lacking power, it's about twice that because of the solar collector. And it might be a little bit less than that when we get finished this year. Um, we also are working with, um, in sanitation, with um, a local, trying to bring together that entrepreneurial function and the maker function. And just to let you know, the numbers really look good for this. Um, here's a, uh, this is, uh, this is the, the assets of that micro franchise enterprise. They grow when, as a loan is being taken. So the, the loan balance grows, 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 but then it falls after about 30 months. The loan is completely paid back. The enterprise is freestanding, making toilets forever. I just, uh, I, I haven't published this paper yet, but it's been accepted uh, for Water and Society. And if anybody wants to preprint that, I'd be happy to send it to you. And so after 24 months, with a, a, a grant or loan of about $5,400, 117 household toilets result in 24 months. But they just keep going. And um, so, um, and look at the number of people impacted. We're talking about a couple of dollars per person impacted. But the assets of that enterprise grow so that they, after month 15, 16, they're using their own funds to make loans. That's a good place to stop. Um, I would, uh, I mentioned to Katie, I'm not sure if I mentioned it to Michael, but. Um, I invite any of you who would like to come down and visit the lab and talk to our talk to our students. This is a just a snippet of some of the things we're working on. Uh, we're working on having the first completely closed toilet in the world, and we're within a heartbeat of that right now. Where even that little bit that eight liters of filtrate will process that. So you put a little bit of water in, wash hands, goes down, separates out the out the, instead of going out the back pipe into a soap hole, it actually gets processed. We have four different schemes that we're using. Two of them, well, one of them has already been proven and published. The second one uh, will probably be finished this semester, and there are two others also in the pipeline, including some fascinating uh, approaches to disinfecting on a rural scale without any Western technology whatsoever. It's a challenge. Engineering students, it's a challenge to work in the building. There's no hardware store down the street. You, you, there's no ace hardware there. You have to use local materials. After you get something working in the lab, I usually send it back and say, okay, now how are we going to do this locally? What are we going to do locally? So that's, um, come down. If, if any of you want, to, you want to sponsor a little trip someday, just let me know when so I can be available to organize a little trip. And also, also, I want you to talk to some students about starting their own world rack club. When we come down, we'll do that. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. So, what with the toilets? I was just wondering what happens to the waste uh, after the end of two years. You said two years, but it's more like two and a half or three years. You remove the back and you you leave the toilet alone for six to ten days, no more than ten days. Some people are saying it's actually six days, so that the last of the waste gets fully digested. And you now take out the richest compost, uh, pathogen-free compost that you can imagine. Okay. Uh, so it's producing a useful product. It's a completely sustainable technology. I've heard of um, them using that to use like methane as well. 
Have you guys looked into that at all? We, we, uh, we have. I'm very familiar with that technology. Um, it's very difficult to do on a household level. Okay. Unless you're on a farm, you have lots of pigs, or unless you have um, 12 or 15 households, you can build a small scale plant uh, to, to, to produce methane. Um, there is uh, no methane, not much methane coming out of our digestive uh, process. The volatiles are, there's a little bit, but not much. You mentioned in passing that, uh, about the security issue of sanitation, and I think that's really actually a major woman's issue because it, it was only about a year ago that we had the news about the two women in India who were yep. raped and hanged Remember that? because they went out into the because business. Because they went out of the darkness. And I don't, don't think that's a nice experience. Yeah. You know, the other thing is 